You know, it took me a lot of time to realise, but after the charities and that I set up, and the various other things I've done to try and change public perception on me, from a negative one to at least a eh kind of one. I don't know why this never came to me before, but I decided to do a music video. And I was able to get Tom on board. And thanks to me using the vocals of various... Um, uh, deceased isn't the right word. Um, Royalty-free artists. We were able to create a song. And obviously a music video to go along with it. And surprisingly, it was fairly successful. The song was about uh, the experiences that we've had over the past year, ever since joining USP and everything that we've went through. And according to stats that uh, it was able to successfully move uh, public opinion of me uh, in a slightly more favourable manner. Though the people who do hate me hate me even more now. And claim that I'm just desperately trying to pander to everyone. Well, of course that's what I'm trying to do. Look, I'm trying to not get myself or anyone else killed. Alright? Because there's some serious nutters out there who will go through with it. Will they regret it later? Maybe, but does that matter when you're dead? Wow, you got justice over my murder. Doesn't exactly stop me from being dead, no, does it? But anyway, what else has been going on? Oh, yes, yes, yes. After months of uh, preparation, I did uh, keep my word, and I allowed James to make a prototype coat for me, which is a deep purple velvet. And you know what? I'm not just saying this, but it's actually quite nice. Yeah, it's a pretty nice coat. And obviously I started wearing it in public and mentioned it and Axe has created a spark so hopefully he might have a production line side and maybe have his own fashion line. <laughs> and he's only 30 years old. I should mention that uh, he finished it actually yeah, a little bit earlier than expected but I uh, kept it a bit of a secret as uh, he gave it to me as a present for my 24th birthday. So yeah, 24. Hooray! Another year going by. Another year that I'm getting older and edging ever so slightly forward towards my utter demise. Yeah, but let's be real, that's not going to be for a long time yet. Hopefully. I did enjoy my uh, 24th birthday, that was a great day. And it's probably the first birthday I've had since my teenage years where I didn't get completely pissed during it. I mean, don't get me wrong, I did have a few drinks. But I didn't go completely overboard. And I say that's a victory for me. Obviously, I could have gone overboard if I wanted to, and I would have the perfect excuse of, oh yeah, it's me birthday, I can do whatever the fuck I want. But I didn't. I think because the actual day itself was exhausting enough for me. That I basically just fell asleep out of sheer exhaustion. So he's uh, still been attending to the Scarverers. You know what? That's going to be a bit more friendly. I mean, I wouldn't call them domesticated by any stretch of the means, but they are a lot more um, civil towards her than initially. Probably gotten used to a scent or something along those lines. And, um, I should probably also mention, uh, I think, uh, me and Sally have a thing going again. I mean, we haven't gone on any actual dates again, but there is definitely a bit of a casual flirting whenever I go out to see how she's doing with the Scarver. So, you know, maybe we could have a thing again. Maybe. <laughs> Everything seemed to be going good and on the uprise. Until I recently received a message via a letter from USP. Because, of course, USP still loves its bloody paperwork on actual paper. 
But anyway, it was something that I'd feared for quite a while. I was being put on trial for the destruction of half of the earth. Obviously, this was something that was probably going to happen someday. I'd done everything I could to try and avoid it. But now there was nothing left to do. It was finally happening. What I needed to find now was a good lawyer. Luckily, because of word of my financial gains and investments over the past few months, I didn't exactly uh, have a shortage of willing lawyers that were willing to defend me. So, to find the best one, I put out um, an ad where each lawyer would just have to write a single A4 spread of how they would be the best in defending me in the case. I know that's not really a conventional way of finding a lawyer though. Well, I needed one desperately. Neither me nor Tom nor anyone else we knew was an expert at picking lawyers, mainly because we'd never needed to before. So we chose this method, even though it was a bit uh, unorthodox, possibly, but... Eh, you've got to take what you can get and use what you know. Once we had successfully found a lawyer, it was now a case of gaining evidence. In my favour, I might add. And heck, wouldn't you know, one of the best pieces of evidence was this very podcast itself. Since it was recorded just before the event itself and just after, it did put it right at the exact moment when everything happened. It also obviously had evidence that I wasn't a malicious killer as some people would like to put it. Obviously, USP had evidence as well to show that, uh, while I was by no means a model employee, I was leaps and bounds away from someone like, well, Spats, I guess, is a good example. But uh, my lawyer also wanted to particularly double down on the fact that I was now a father angle as... He said that, uh, well, Quark seemed to be more sympathetic towards them. It seems ludicrous, but it's true. If you come up with some sort of a uh, sob story and a woe is me, true, you might get a bit of sympathy, although you might just come off as very self-centred and ignorant of everyone else. But if you say, look, how I did things were wrong in Max, but... I'm the only one now who can look after my kid, yada, 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 yada. Corks are apparently more sympathetic as that. And you got to remember, you're dealing with real people. Corks and everything would be so much easier if it was just a machine that decided it. Everything would be over so much quicker. I do wonder if it was a machine that was just deciding my faith. Would it... Decide that I was innocent or guilty. Who knows? I do know, however, if I was guilty, I would definitely be receiving at least a life prison sentence. I've honestly been surprised I've been granted pretty much freedom until this point. I was told that apparently the court case had been dropped for quite a while, actually. However, it had recently been opened back up due to... Either new witness or new evidence. My lawyer was unable to really pinpoint it down. And for those who are wondering, Tom was on trial along with me. His crime was the aid and assistance of mine. Well, although he was unconscious at the time, when I blew up half the earth, he was the one who helped to enable it. Though, to be honest, his could go either way. 
in terms of like these words, there's so many things that rushes through your head. Like, what's going to happen to my house? And all my things, and what about the scarver? You know, my back garden. I sincerely doubt they'll be attended to after the employees are no longer getting paid. Will Sally still be living in my basement, or will she be off back to where she was before? And obviously, most importantly, what the hell is going to happen to James? Is he going to be put in care? Well, if me and Tom are found guilty, then almost certainly. I trust that if I was found guilty, but Tom was found innocent, he would take care of him. But even so, I don't want that happening. Although he would still be getting looked after and everything. I vowed that I would do that, personally. At least I knew that the jury would not have any humans on it. Due to basically everyone having some sort of bias who was on Earth, and even the humans who were living on Mars, most of them had a bias of some sort, even though some of them had lived there for generations. They'd still never forgotten where they came from. And believe me, I can imagine finding an unbiased jury for my crimes would be an extremely difficult process. Still though, if they were successful in finding an unbiased jury, at least that would give me some chance or opportunity. Well, I hope so anyway. Well, it finally came the day. The first day of my trial. I did what you're obviously supposed to do. Dress in a suit, shirt and tie. As if you were going to an interview. The trial was appropriately or maybe inappropriately held on earth. In London of all places. You know, a lot of people who have never been to the UK before. Or have only ever been to London or have seen pictures now of London. Assume that the whole... Of the UK is like that. It's not. In fact whenever I used to go to London. It was like going to another country. I used to play a game called spot a British person. As generally no one British actually lives there. It's just a place where we can shove all the tourists. Upon arriving there was obviously a variety of people there. While obviously there was people there. You know showing their support. There was also the people there with their. Uh, their pitchforks and torches, so to speak. As well as that, there was the press. There was basically as many people as you could possibly think to imagine were there, were there. We had to have the way cleared for us to enter the courthouse. Me, Tom and James slowly made our way forward, avoiding eye contact with everyone. I didn't want James to be there, but, well, the court insisted because apparently they wanted him... As a witness or someone to question or something along those lines. <sighs> so I had no choice in that matter. But out of all the things that I'd been prepared for that day, the one thing that I was completely unprepared for is when I walked through those court doors and came face to face with Spitz McKendry. Well, Mr. Doncaster... I have been waiting for this day a very long time. It's something I've most been looking forward to. <laughs> he continued to cough and snarl. In that moment, I was frozen. Sure, there was the temptation to grab him and throttle him down to the ground. Though out of everything, I just wanted to know why. He was the prosecution. Him! McKendry had been silent for months and months by that point. No one had heard a peep out of him, ever since I set a light to his tomb of riches. And yet here he was, not only walking around freely, but actively being a prosecutor. How the hell could USP allow this? How could anyone allow this? My lawyer of all people was the one to break this silence. He said to McKendry that his client had nothing to say at the current point but would answer all questions truthfully and honestly when under oath, and suggested that he should do the same. He then walked the three of us past McKendry. As he did, I took a single glance over at McKendry. In that time, he was able to say to me, I meant what I said. It is legitimately good to see you again. 
My lawyer then led us into a small room. In the middle was a table surrounded by a few chairs. When we all had entered the room, he then closed the doors and locked them behind him. As he did so, Tom was the first one to yell at him. He asked him, obviously, what the hell is McKendry doing here? How did this happen? And how long did he know about this? Did he know about this beforehand? Or was he just as surprised as we were? I, meanwhile, sat down at the table, placing both of my elbows side by side on the table, then clasping my fingers together so that my head may rest on it. I then began to mutter to myself, Was he out of something else? No. Was he wanting? Did he just want me? No. Think it could be the next thing. Think massive distraction. How did he manage to get to this position? No. He said, I don't know, this trial's not legitimate or something. What on earth is he up to? Tom then proceeded to bang the table with his hand to get my attention. I then proceeded to lift my head up and make eye contact with Tom, who then proceeded to say, any comments then, Don Free, on the situation? I replied to him with, We're all always up to something, the question is what? He can't just want me, not this time. Even though this trial has brought me out into the open, it will be much easier for him to just track me down and kidnap me quite quietly. It's possible it could be a distraction for something. After all, this trial's going to be televised. The whole world will be watching, as well as others. It could be multiple things all at once. James then butted in at this point. Do you think he could want the Scarverers? James, if he wanted the Scarverers, he would simply just take them then and there like that. Besides, McKendry isn't no spats. Spats for, well, all of his folks, at least you can see he's a simple-minded person. He wants power over people and nothing more. McKendry? Well, he's motivated by his fear of death and fear of being forgotten. And those things can drive people to crazy lengths. I should know I once had the same mindset as him. My lawyer then silenced us all, and told us that the priority was to put our case forward, improving mine and Tom's innocence. There was a part of me that thought maybe that was the distraction in itself, just the sheer shocking speculation of seeing McKendry again. Maybe it would put my focus off actually winning the case. Well, when you put it that way, it almost seems plausible. My lawyer continued to go over all the evidence that we'd heard a thousand times with him. While me and Tom were just doing the thing of nodding and occasionally going, yeah. We were both putting together a case in our head in trying to figure out what on earth McKendry was up to. As time passed, well, I see time passed. It could have been minutes, it could have been hours, but regardless, we were informed that it was time for my trial to begin. We all entered the courtroom. Myself, Tom, and my lawyer were seated at the front, whilst James was sat in the row just behind us. The judge then finally emerged. It was a species that I'd never seen before. In terms of size, it was very large and elephant-like. Though it had a large, squared pink head, with two big black eyes, but a uh, pretty small mouth in the middle. It kind of reminded me of a pop vinyl. The jury was also a mix of different species. Again, none of which I particularly recognised from when I'd gone on missions of USP or from their backlog. Though to be honest, I was glad to see it. It seemed that maybe they had gone to an effort to try and make the jury as unbiased as possible. Though what was also going through my head is that it could have easily been orchestrated by McKendry, who sat with presumably his lawyer across from us. Him and his lawyer seemed to be looking over some documents. They both huddled over it to avoid it being seen by anyone. They then placed this documentation into a briefcase. I did consider that maybe I was just overthinking things, and maybe it was just evidence in that for the trial. I did have to just keep telling myself that, otherwise I won't be able to think of nothing else. After a few minutes, the judge then finally battered his gavel. The courtroom then uttered into silence. He then proceeded to read the statement in front of him, which told the jury what I was on trial for, in being the person ultimately responsible for destroying half of the earth, and that I was also assisted by Tom. 
The judge then asked for the prosecutor to make their first statement. McKendry's lawyer then stood up. He was about five foot six and had a weasel like appearance. He spoke fairly softly at first, but emphasizing sharp and snappy words to try and emphasize my guilt. For example, he started off a sentence with Mr. Goncaster actively disobeyed his orders from USP, and because of that, caused the death of countless innocent people. To be honest, when watching him, it was almost like he was doing some sort of hammy performance. The whole time I had my eyes wide open at him, and each time he said something, my jaw dropped a bit further. To be honest, it took all of my effort to not burst out laughing at him. I'd seen acting more subtle at the London Dungeon than him. After a couple of minutes, he'd finally finished. Jugs then turned over to us and asked for the defence to give their opening statement. My lawyer then stood up and had basically uttered everything that I'd been seeing on this, well, not just the podcast, but in life in general, of how I didn't really have much of a choice and either outcome would not be good. And yada yada, he kind of waffled it on for quite a bit. To be honest, it bored me. After witnessing the most hammy performance of my life by McKendry's lawyer, mine was as, as charismatic as an English teacher. Now, people may say, you know, these things don't matter. It's all about the evidence and that. But I find if you engage with people, you know, more and don't come off as dreary, dull and boring, you've got a much better chance of getting them on board with your way of thinking. Otherwise, you're just going to, well, simply just turn them away. At this point, I was considering defending myself and doing my own over-the-top performance. At the very least, it would hold the jury's attention. For the next few, what felt like hours, there was a lot of back and forthing and questioning this and questioning that, and a lot of under oath of, do you swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? They both questioned me and Tom. Though they both did it separately, and while one of us was questioned, the other was to leave the room. Just in case there was the off chance we gave conflicting statements, and we were both lying. We obviously weren't. Tom was obviously only able to recall up to a certain point of when he lost consciousness. But then I was asked a question that I didn't actually have an answer to. McKendry's lawyer asked me who Marvis was. And to be honest, I couldn't give him a straight answer. I explained how I met him, but then... But I admitted that I didn't really know him very well at all. He then asked me, how would he have the capability to teleport me and Tom out if all signals were blocked? Because otherwise, shouldn't I have been able to contact USP? Again, I didn't really have an answer. I said... Well, it, it, it's something I'd never thought about. I have no idea how Marvis was able to teleport me and Tom out of there. I presume he was able to break through the barrier that was blocking the signals. I honestly don't know. The kangaroo's lawyer then smiled and placed both of his hands behind his back and proceeded to walk towards me coming in at a few inches away from my face. He then asked me where Marvis was now, and why he wasn't called as a witness for this trial. I then replied with, Well, me and Tom don't really have a way to contact him. He contacts us. Well, I see that. He just, really, he just shows up out of nowhere. So you see, there was just no way to contact him for this trial. And to be honest, I don't see the relevancy of it as Marvis had nothing to do, nor was witness to these events. That only happened afterwards. McKendry's lawyer then asked me if Marvis could have orchestrated it, set up the whole thing. I obviously denied this. He then asked me a counter question, seeing how I had just admitted that I barely knew Marvis. How was I not sure that he was not capable of doing something, or unwilling to? I then replied, I know enough. I know that Marvis is a good person. When we first met him, he saved myself and my friend Billy's life. He then gave me a new lease on life. 
becoming half Scarborough. It felt like being reborn again, getting a new life, leaving the old one behind. And then when things were gurking down again, he got the three of us jobs at USP. And although he wasn't in time to save Billy, he was able to save myself and Tom. And believe me, at that moment, I did not want to be saved. I was ready and willing to die with everyone else. But you know what? I'm now glad that he did save me. Because he gave me a new lease on life again, which I didn't think was possible. And better than that, thanks to him saving my life, I now have a reason to live. A reason for not wanting to die. And that reason is sitting in this court. My son James, it's the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I'll admit it may have happened by accident and be complete coincidence. But I don't get it. Because it means now, I can try and make his life better. As well as everybody else's that I ruined. I can't fix the past, but I can try and make a better future. The judge then made a statement, asking McKendry's lawyer if he had finished. Which McKendry's lawyer stated that he had. I was allowed to go and sit back down. The judge then turned over to the jury telling them that they had heard all the evidence for for and against, all the usual stuff that was expected, and how it was up to them whether I was innocent or guilty. If innocent, then, well, I'd be allowed to go free. But it's when he read the if guilty part of that statement. He said, if I was found guilty, then my punishment would be to assist Spix McKendry in locating Marvis. It now all clicked. This wasn't about me. I was just a bonus for him. I was just going to be used as a tool. This wasn't about him trying to get revenge on me. Or make a huge distraction while he does some other illegal crimes somewhere else. It was about none of that. The whole time. Spix McKendry wanted Marvis. The question is. For what purpose? <laughs>